Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking with friend of the show, Dr. Peter Hotez, Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development in Houston, Texas, about COVID-19's origin story and why it matters. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Well, Dr. Hotez, thanks for joining us again. Uh, now, I know because I saw the movie 12 Monkeys that it's very important, even if you have to travel back in time, to find the origin of a virus in a big pandemic. Now, that was fiction, and so I'm interested if you would share with our audience out there uh, the reality of why it's so important to understand the origin of the COVID-19 virus and kind of what do we do with that? Yeah, absolutely, Todd. And, and, and first of all, thanks for having me back. I always enjoy speaking with you and working with the AMA. You know, I think the reason it's so important is, is very straightforward. This is COVID-19 is not our first major coronavirus epidemic. This is our third one in the last 20 years. So the third one of the 21st century, we had uh, SARS, the original uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, slash epidemics, the severe acute respiratory syndrome rose out of Guangdong province in South China in 2002, and then spread uh, to Toronto and caused a lot of uh, deaths and havoc in the city of Toronto, shut down the city for a while in 2003. Then we had MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2012, and, um, and that has lasted a few years. It went into South Korea and caused a hospital associated outbreak uh, there. And again, very high mortality and a lot of deaths. And that's why we started working on coronavirus vaccines. We were mostly working on parasitic disease vaccines. But, you know, I said to my science co partner for the last 20 years, Mary Elena Patazzi, Dr. Patazzi said, Mary Elena, you know, this isn't going to be the last one. We've had two now. You know, there's a message here. Um, we're going to have a third one, and uh, and probably it's going to come out of China. We got to start working on coronavirus vaccines. And guess what? That that's what happened right on cue. And uh, and I tell that story for a couple of reasons. One that we've been working on coronavirus vaccines for for ten years, and and that's always useful because people claim you know the COVID vaccines appeared out of nowhere. They weren't. I mean, we did a lot of work showing that the spike protein was the target of the virus and how you deliver the spike protein and how you virus neutralizing antibodies are so important. But the other is to say that we expected another coronavirus uh, pandemic slash epidemic. This was the worst by far, uh, but, but it's useful because it reminds people that this was not entirely unexpected. And, and so the reason why it's so important to uncover the origins is because we still don't understand the forces that are in play to make coronaviruses emerge. We know bats have an important role because coronaviruses are found naturally in bats. And by the way, bats are natural hosts to other catastrophic viruses. Nipah virus, for instance, that caused a terrible epidemic in India in 2018, Ebola. Ebola circulates in, in bats. So that was important in 2014 and then 2019. And so the point is that understanding how bat ecology interfaces with other animal reservoirs as a second intermediate host or how uh, the viruses jump from bats to people or bats to another animal to people. This has become one of the most important themes in understanding the origin of, of pandemics. And, and that's, why, that's why it's so absolutely critical to understand because this has become now a new normal of catastrophic epidemics and pandemics. Um, often often involving bat uh, bat origins uh, as well and and this has become now a global priority well first of all it's a good thing that that research had been underway for a decade which i'm imagining put us a great deal farther ahead in terms of vaccine development for this novel coronavirus um, second i want to kind of zero in on some of the, the i guess i'll call them True, two primary theories uh, are around the origin. One is kind of what you talked about before, which is kind of a, you know animal to human transmission and how that occurs with bats and other animals. And uh, a second being more man-made lab origin. So can you talk about you know these two ideas just 
kind of quickly, but I want to delve into more about, you know, the support on either end for those. Yeah. So, you know, when I, you know, when, so the point is we were expecting to see another major coronavirus pandemic and it happened and no surprise to us that it arose out of China, in this case, not South China, like SARS, but central China. So I was a little surprised when all of a sudden we started seeing papers or articles pop up saying, hey, wait a minute, this didn't happen through uh, natural, this was through uh, deliberate uh, gain of function research that people were manipulating coronaviruses in order to cause this this pandemic. And I thought, well, that did, that didn't make any sense to me because we've known that these viruses are emerging on a regular basis. And then I looked at what the evidence being cited um, for this. And you know, one of the things that came out early was they're saying, hey, look, this virus uh, has a furin cleavage site, which is a cleavage site for a protease, a class of proteases known as furins. And some very prominent scientists were touting that as evidence that there was some type of laboratory manipulation involved. And that didn't make any sense to me either because Mayer's Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome has a furin, uh, the virus has a furin cleavage site. And, and now we know multiple beta coronaviruses in this family have furin cleavage sites. So there's nothing particularly unique about that. And so you just saw, um, you know, a lot of talking heads uh, say that they've got the smoking gun that uh, the SARS-2 coronavirus is through gain of function research. And each one I looked at, I said, that's not a smoking gun at all. I mean, the, we know the, a lot about coronaviruses and, and you know, I just don't see the evidence for gain of function. And then um, it was uh, the lab leak theory that, uh, so then it kind of, shifted a bit, although there's still many who claim or want to claim that it's gain of function research, which I'm not convinced about. Then there are those who are saying, well, maybe it was leaked from a lab either through gain of function or maybe um, research was being done on bat coronaviruses and it was maintained in the lab and then there was an accidental laboratory leak. And I said, well, you know, what's what's the evidence for that? Well, they say, you know, there was a what there's a well-known Coronavirus Research Institute in uh, in uh, Wuhan province, and and the epicenter of the epidemic initially was, was in Wuhan, and I said, well, Wuhan's a, a massive city, and and uh, I don't see necessarily um, that that is a smoking gun uh, either, because we know there are bat caves all over central China and Hubei province and Yunnan province, uh, you know, and and so there was what, what impressed upon me was the zeal that people had to want to show that it was gain of function or or lab leak and i said look it's not impossible but here's what we need to do the most important thing is to uncover the origins and the only way you're really going to do that whether it's lab leak or or otherwise is to do an outbreak investigation um and we know how to do this. We need to bring in a team of scientists that are working in Hubei province, international scientists, U.S. scientists, working with Chinese scientists to collect uh, saliva blood samples from bats, from other potential secondary animal sources from humans, and really trace the origins of COVID-19. And then I make the statement, we have to do this because otherwise, we still, if we don't understand it, how are we going to prevent COVID twenty six or COVID uh, thirty two, and um, and and that needs to be the priority. Now, if during that investigation, you might uncover some evidence that um, that it might, there might be a lab leak uh, somewhere. It's not impossible. I doubt it, but uh, I I can't say it's impossible. And but the emphasis has to be on the scientific investigation in cooperation with the Chinese. That, that, that would be the ideal uh, situation. We could talk about some of the, the, the problems uh, associated with that, but instead what you're getting is um, so many uh, individuals and some scientists that I have a lot of respect for are so focused on the lab leak and the gain of function. And then I say, well, and, and they talk about how we've got to throw 
or U.S. intelligence at this? And I said, well, heck, U.S. intelligence has been all over this for the last year, right? I mean, it's, uh, and you can throw all the intelligence you want at it, but it's not a substitute for doing mm-hmm. a scientific investigation. And they say, well, we got to look at the lab notebooks. I said, well, first of all, the Wuhan Institute of Virology is by no means the only institute in China working on coronaviruses. What happened after SARS? Well, there are multiple university labs all over China, probably in Hubei province as well, um, that are that began working on coronaviruses. There's no particular reason to focus only on the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And they say, well, it's because there was an NIH grant given to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and um, there was uh, uh, a specific aim, and therefore potentially looking at uh, the virus and substituting different spike protein genes. And I said, you know, but you know that it, there's so there was this sort of misunderstanding about how how science is done in China. There's this misperception that the labs are underfunded and that there's um, they're just sitting around waiting for an NIH grant to, to provide the funding so they can do the research. And in fact, the amount of funding from an NIH grant that was going to uh, China for this kind of research is, was extremely modest. The Chinese don't, you know, the Chinese labs are extremely well funded now. The, the environment in China has changed dramatically over the last decade or so. In fact, uh, American laboratories are losing a lot of Chinese scientists who are going back to China because they're so so well funded. So again, there's this kind of misunderstanding, I think, about um, the science ecosystem that, that goes on in China as well. So again, not impossible that there's a lab leak involved. I don't think so. Um, there's not, it's, and I don't see any smoking gun for deliberate kinds of gain of function mm-hmm. research. Well, two follow-up questions. First, you said something uh, earlier. You said, you know, understanding the origin of COVID-19 will help us prevent COVID-23. What do you mean by that? What specifically does having that origin story for COVID-19 nailed down do to help you prevent future versions of it? Well, for instance, one of the things that I'd like to know is are, vi- are coronaviruses jumping from bats to humans all the time? Um, you know, wouldn't you know? For instance, when we read about the history of HIV/AIDS, it wasn't a one-time jump, right, from non-human primates to people. It probably happened multiple times over over many years, maybe decades, before it finally sort of took hold and got critical mass and and ign- whatever metaphor you want to use and ignited and it really took off. It's probably the same with coronaviruses as well. They're probably jump. Um, my uh, one hypothesis is that they're jumping from bats to people or bats to people through an intermediate animal host on multiple occasions. I think we need to know that. Um, uh, I think we need to know um, if there are secondary animals involved, what are the characteristics of it? It's often said that it's because of the unique types of animals uh, found in the Chinese wet markets, possibly, but we need to know that. That doesn't explain what happened, for instance, with mares, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome and the involvement of camels, for instance. So uh, I think there's so much we don't know, and I don't see how you could think about designing prevention strategies without having some understanding of that. Mm -hmm. Well, the other the term that you uh, also used is this one called gain of function research, which, as uh, you know, to the lay person like me, sounds very scary. Let's just put it that way. Is is this a common thing? Uh, you know, does it apply to coronavirus research right now? And you know, is this research, you know, the the potential uh, risks of it kind of outweigh the benefits? Yeah, I mean, this has been hotly debated under uh, by, you know, by bioethicists and and scientists, and it usually refers to taking a human pathogen and and making it more virulent um, so that uh, it's better at infecting people and making people sicker. Uh, As far as I know, that kind of research was never in the cards for coronaviruses, at least anything that's in the public domain, I think. You know, looking at that NIH grant, the, that looked more like taking um, animal coronaviruses and seeing if there are things that make it um, more efficient at uh, binding to 
to different cell types. So it's just not really quite the same as gain of function research, although many, many call it that. But the point is, um, true, true and unrelated, whatever kind of research was going on um, to understand coronaviruses, I just haven't seen uh, any strong evidence that it was linked to the origins of COVID-19 and, and recognizing that it, it probably was jumping from animals to humans for quite a while. Let me give you an example. Um, they went with SARS in 2003. The first outbreak, I think, was February of 2003, but now they've traced it back to an individual for four or five months prior to that. And and that that is not an uncommon time frame. So for instance, John Brownstein at Harvard Medical School has done some nice work looking at satellite images and looking doing Google searches and seeing that there was a, an uptick in, in hospital activity in central China uh, four or five months before uh, COVID-19 hit. That, that would make some sense to me, but there's enough uncertainty that we really need to do that kind of uh, uh, outbreak investigation. And if all you do are hurl um, threats at at the government of China, and all you do is say, you know, we're gonna f find your notebooks, look, go through your notebooks until we find something that we want to look for, you know, that's just not going to go anywhere. And then I even say, what are you going to do? I mean, let's say you have access to the notebooks. First of all, uh, if you were to add up all the notebooks on coronavirus research in central China, right? We're talking about hundred thousand hundreds of thousands of pages, right? Which all would have to be what translated into uh, English or some other language. And and then what are you gonna do is search term for the word whoops with a with a with a exclamation point. I, you know, this is easier said than done. So uh, I, I think the focus right now needs to be on on sending a, an envoy to China, meeting with the leadership of Chinese scientists and convincing them to do a proper international uh, outbreak investigation. And that's not quick work, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be a year, at least in the field of, of virologists, of epidemiologists, of bat ecologists, to really uh, do a deep dive in understanding um, how coronaviruses are emerging. And, and we have to do this. We, if we, if other, otherwise, we're going to be, again, shooting blind and understanding how coronaviruses uh, emerge. In the course of it, it may come out that, um, you know, that in talking and interviewing with scientists that maybe there was a lab leak involved. I, I think probably not, but that's the only way you're going to do it. If you simply are uh, point accusatory fingers and demand, you know, um, an FBI style investigation, one, it's not going to happen. And second, it won't be very productive. Well, that, that lab leak theory, I would say originally was kind of brushed off kind of a little bit as a conspiracy theory, but for whatever reason in recent uh, kind of months has seemed to gain back a little traction. There are all sorts so, of so questions. Can I, so let me, yeah. let me make a comment on that because I've seen that, you know, especially on the conservative news networks, they say, you know, we were saying this all along and the scientists brushed us off and saying it's not possible. That's not what happened. That's, mm -hmm. a rev that's revisionist history. I know what happened because I was, uh, you know, being interviewed on the cable news networks when a, uh, a, a White House, uh, a person from the White House, from the West Wing, not, not, not connected with the COVID-19 uh, task, coronavirus task force, you know, came out and said that um, um, he, they, they, they feel that the quote, Chinese Communist Party is uh, taking infected Chinese citizens and sending them abroad to deliberately ignite the epidemic. That, that's what they were saying. Mm. And that's what I said, this is nonsense, right? There's no evidence for that. And, um, and it's totally irresponsible and it's deflecting from really trying to uh, battle COVID-19. That's what I went up against. I, you know, there was never about the lab leak. And then over time, um, the, the right-wing media kind of uh, revise that to say that we were discounting lab leaks. I was, that, that's not what I pushed, mm -hmm. uh, at least what I, that's what, not what I pushed back again. I pushed back from these outrageous conspiracy theories of sending infected Chinese abroad. And, and, uh, and that, that's that. 
Does that, the, I guess there was a report in the New York Times not long ago about kind of missing sequences of uh, the virus in an online database. Is this just, again, central to the story, not central to the story, or well, is it, it really? Well, it wasn't all that hidden because my understanding is somebody picked it right up in, in another file. So uh, I, don't, I don't know what to make of that. So it mm -hmm. seemed to me if people were, I, I actually didn't follow that story very closely, but it seems to me if somebody were um, deliberately trying to hide things, it wouldn't be so easy to recover those sequences, right? So, you know, I, I hear, I think what you're saying comes through loud and clear is that we do need to investigate this and we do need a uh, scientifically based look at how this is because just like you said 10 years ago, we could be facing another version of this years from now and probably, you know, that's likely given the experience to date. Are there any other kind of lessons uh, that we should learn from, you know, what we've gone through that would uh, apply to the situation we're facing now? Well, I think, you know, it's not that the Chinese government gets a total free pass on this either, right? I mean, I didn't learn about COVID-19 until New Year's Eve of 2019-2020, going to 2019-2020, right? But this, this out, outbreak epidemic was, was well underway. And it would have been really helpful if we had known that all through the month of December, because um, once we had the sequence, we were able to move pretty quickly. So the, the sequence came online January 14th. And that's when I said to my science partner, yeah, I think we can, we, you know, we can make a vaccine. We contacted the NIH and, and we were off, off to the races. But um, there should have been more of a heads up. I mean, the South China Morning Post uh, put out an article saying that the, the, at least the original known patient was uh, in early, mid-November. And so not having that transparency with all of the things that we had put in place, you know, it's not like, you know, the, the world hadn't learned from previous pandemics after uh, 2005, the, uh, after uh, SARS in 2003, the WHO put in place international health regulations and a global health security agenda after H1N1 and then CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness. So we we have built infrastructure that's made a difference uh, after each uh, uh, epidemic. So the fact that things did not go as smoothly, you know, in, in November and December, that needs to be looked at uh, as well. And because again, otherwise, we're just not gonna be able to, to manage this. And we saw how quickly right, this epidemic spread. I mean, if you remember uh, President Trump, you know, one of the first things he spoke about was the travel ban on China, right? After, and that was in, I think, in February. And now we know that uh, by the, or March, I think it was, we, now we know that uh, by the time that travel ban in China was in place, the virus had already entered New York City from Southern Europe and ignited that first wave of the terrible epidemic. So it looked like it that hit southern China, southern Europe pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. that's how that's another and that's not wasn't even the Delta variant. That was the original lineage of was Delta it probably would have even we know it's uh, much more transmissible. So I think the other lesson is these viral uh, outbreaks can move very, very quickly far, you know, maybe far faster than many of us are aware. So really being on top of it is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, Dr. Hotes, it's always so fascinating to talk to you. I really, really appreciate you being on our update today, and we'll look forward to uh, getting more perspective from you down the road. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. Uh, we'll be back soon with another segment. In the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.